when you guys got clicker. Uh, clicker. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, yeah. Hi, guys. Welcome. Uh, this is a presentation by the Logan Report Carousel, uh, co hosted by us at LAPS, the Victoria Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, I want to acknowledge today the territory which we stand on of the, the Kwangan speaking people and also the Wasanich and the Esquimalt people whose uh, relationships we still hold with the land. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to give uh, an introduction on uh, what FABS does. Uh, we're a community psychedelic organization, hosts things like integration circles, discussion circles, movie screenings, and uh, yeah, things like guest lectures, uh, as you can see. Um, I'm the director. I'm a psych student, uh, passionate about psychedelic therapy. My name's Daniel, if anyone didn't catch that. And uh, yeah, really excited to uh, to have the lovely Yasmin Sensei give us a presentation on the state of psychedelic medicine in Canada as it is right now. Yeah, it's probably the most updated, in depth perspective that we can get right at the, the forefront. And, yeah, I'm grateful for everything that you do and we remain in positive regard to positive. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for showing up today. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, you can't let us know there's a little mic we can strap on. But uh, yeah, last time uh, last time I was at UVic was three years ago when Bruce Tobin, the founder of Theracell, uh, messaged me after uh, I had been emailing him kind of incessantly asking to help with this project that is Theracil. Uh, he actually used to be a professor, he's an adjunct professor at University of Victoria. So in a way, this is where the Canadian, you know, or at least the most recent wave of Canadian advocacy for psychedelics, specifically psilocybin, all started. Uh, so, you know, excellent work to all of you to keep this society alive and well and, and growing and thriving because a small group like this, or even just a professor at a school, can, as you will see, do a lot uh, to change Canadian law and regulations around psilocybin. Uh, so yeah, I'm Spencer Oxwell. This is and uh, Yasmin Sedin. Cricket, and I'm the CEO of Thursil, and yes, is the Director of Training and Operations. Yeah. And uh, the organization, Thursil, uh, is a nonprofit organization where we're the coalition of healthcare professionals, patients, and citizens. Uh, again, started by our UVic University professor, Dr. Bruce Tobin. Uh, but the whole point of the organization is to change laws at the regulatory level. So within our, what's called the uh, Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which is the regulations that controls many of the things that we all use on a daily basis, like alcohol and tobacco, marijuana. Um, so when Bruce Tobin, uh, a, I call him a hippie, uh, who, <laughs> who had uh, been using psychedelics throughout the 60s, uh, ran into a patient, and uh, Bruce is a registered psychologist, doctor in psychology in Northwest Territories. Uh, when he was doing uh, some work with a client who developed um, bilateral breast cancer and was given a terminal diagnosis, he thought to himself, well, with all of this new research coming out of Johns Hopkins and NYU, if I know of these tools and I have this, you know, this oath, this, this moral uh, obligation to use all of the tools that I know that are available to treat my patient, and I know it's still side, then I have to go after that. I have to try and help relieve this person's end of life distress with psilocybin. And a very important thing happened after the uh, John Hopkins studies. Uh, how many people know about the John Hopkins studies? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, I believe it was Roland Griffiths, after years of psilocybin being illegal, was able to get a clinical trial started where with a number of participants uh, that had a terminal diagnosis and severe end of life distress, which is this combination of hopelessness, demoralization, anxiety, depression, uh, he was able to give them a single dose, 25 milligrams, so about the same as 5 grams of psilocybin, and in almost 80% of those people, they reported clinically significant decreases in their you know, depression and this hopelessness. And some of them, I believe, went on to say that it was one of the top three or four most important uh, you know, uh, experiences in their entire lifetime, like up there with the birth of a child or with a marriage. And at the end of the day, if any substance or drug is 80% successful at either decreasing, clinically decreasing uh, these uh, terrible symptoms, 
that it was worth exploring, worth at least giving someone a chance of recreating. So this wonderful research is out there. And then in 2016, the Carter case allows maybe in Canada medical assistance in dying. And so for the first time in our country, you're actually allowed to end your life with medical assistance in dying, but you weren't able to try mushrooms. And this was just logically incoherent. Uh, and Bruce said, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to let my patient go through this. Uh, I'm actually going to challenge the laws and try and find a way to get them access to psilocybin. And so that's really where the name Theracil came from, uh, was Bruce working with his patient, Mon Estrella, uh, who used to be a, on the board of directors as well. Uh, she now lives in, I believe, Squamal, or in that area. Uh, but she's been a lifelong advocate of, of psychedelics in general and was actually able to get legal psilocybin access in 2020. Uh, but I'll talk about how we got there because there's a couple of slides here that I'm going to go through. Um, so the way we wanted to get there uh, was first a legal challenge. And so uh, does anyone, has anyone read like the cases that got us legal marijuana or anyone familiar with that, with that legal challenge? Okay. So how do we have legal marijuana in this country? It's from our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was actually made by Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and brought in as our foundational, like the bedrock of our rights in Canada. And within that, there's a whole bunch of different sections. I won't bore you with all of them, um, but a lot of it uh, has to do with, you know, what, like gender-based equality uh, that was set into there. Um, in addition, our rights to things like life, liberty, and security of persons. And what that essentially means is that we all have the right to Free. We have the right to make our own choices. Uh, we have the right to security in this country. These are all the things that, that really I think make Canada what it is. And so when they took those two constitutional rights and applied it to cannabis back in the early 2000s, uh, the government ruled that it would actually infringe upon our rights to life and liberty if somebody that was smoking cannabis to get rid of their cluster headaches or their insomnia uh, or any medical condition, if they weren't able to access it, it was an infringement on the rights. And so because of this 17 year process that got us up to the legalization of cannabis, it was actually a bit shorter because there are a couple of rulings. We were able to get cannabis as a, not a prescribed drug necessarily, but a kind of like a natural health product, something that a doctor could prescribe to patients. Uh, and that same kind of charter right also gave Canadians the right to abortion as well, gave them the right to medical assistance in dying, uh, and so surely, you know, it would give them access to medical health or medical psilocybin, right? If you're suffering from an illness and you have the right to end your life, if you have the right to cannabis, you have the right to make choices for your body, you should have the right to psilocybin. So we knew that that was going to be uh, a winnable case. Um, and so that's where it started was with a legal challenge. Um, but legal challenges take a really, really, really long time. So what we decided to do is make an organization that would go beyond the legal challenge and do a bit of advocacy work. And the organization landed with this mission statement. We built the organization on four core pillars that in my opinion should have been there for things like medical assistance and dying and cannabis. And we wanted to learn from those mistakes, the things that were missed in Canadian history and try to apply them to psilocybin. And so what we came upon was that first we need compassionate access. Without a doubt, people need to be able to access psilocybin. They also need public education. So if we're going to be speaking about how great psilocybin is, obviously there are merits, but there are also limitations to any substance out there. Uh, our lawyer, David Wood, I think famously says, there's no such thing as a safe drug. Uh, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, while psilocybin is relatively safe uh, compared to other substances, we want to be careful not to preach it as some sort of no silver bullet or golden pill that's going to solve everything. There are limitations. The third is professional training. And this is what I guess is going to talk in depth about. Um, essentially, if psilocybin, again, is going to be prescribed or made available for people, that's consistent with the research. You need really, really well qualified doctors, therapists, clinical counselors, nurses, really just clinicians who are going to help with this medical process, especially now where a lot of these patients are terminally ill, end of life, or on a you know, variety of different drugs or have comorbidities, understanding the medical side of psilocybin is really, really important. And that happens in professional training. And finally, research. 
uh, if you're going to do anything, you should probably measure whether or not it's helping. So that's always been core to our heart, making sure that we're measuring the results of what we're doing so that we can show not only the public and the professionals and the patients that this is working, but also sleep at night, knowing that we're making the world better, you know, not, not bringing it back. Uh, and again, you know, this could be maybe a shortcoming of some of the past drugs that have been brought into Canadian society, uh, such as some opioids that might have been overprescribed, right? You've got to be careful with any substances. Uh, there's likely a reason that they're illegal. So ensuring that bringing them back is done responsibly was really important to us. So here's just a little timeline. Uh, 2017, I should add to that, is when Bruce brought the native Therosil together. Um, it was in 2020 that Mona, who I had uh, talked about earlier, and Bruce uh, were in Mexico and started talking about getting together and, and advocating for psilocybin. Um, I kind of want to jump ahead here. Um, the way we did it, this is Bruce Tobin here, by the way. Uh, the way we thought we would try and bypass a you know four-year court challenge was by actually appealing to the Minister of Health. And so in Canada, within our Charter of Rights and Freedoms that I was talking about, that's kind of like the rights for all Canadians, but we also have the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And that's the act that dictates how drugs are to be uh, not only um, provided and, and made available, but also more importantly, which ones are illegal, which drugs we can use. Uh, and within that, there's a special clause that the Minister of Health, uh, for anyone who's not too into Canadian politics, that's really just our top elected health official, and a key word is elected. So this is someone who you know our government has put into a position of power, uh, and that the people have voted there. They're responsible. And back in 2020, that was Patty Haiju. She was the Minister of Health. And now in 2023, that is Jean Duclo and Caroline Bennett. We actually have two, a Minister of Health and a Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. And they are completely responsible for that Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And because they're an elected official, we can actually appeal to them and ask them uh, to give an exemption. And so that is called Section 56 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. The minister may, for whatever grounds they deem necessary, provide exemptions to any provisions of this act. And so what that means is that I think there's Lori Brooks up there, uh, Mona Strelev, and Thomas Hartle, right here, put uh, applications forward, all of them having a terminal illness, and requested compassion from the Minister of Health, and essentially made the argument that I presented to all of you in the beginning. Minister, we have the right to things like uh, life, liberty, and security of persons through medical assistance and dying, and medical cannabis. We have the right to make our own choices. We have the right to uh, you know, freedom in this country. Uh, if you're going to grant me the right to die, grant me the right to try psilocybin. And I think that that's really the straw that broke the camel's back here, because it's very easy for a minister of health or for elected officials to say no to theoretical patients, right? To look at a court case and say, well, this has to go to the government. But for that same elected official to stare down Lori Brooks or Thomas Hartle and say, no, you can't try this thing, even though you have these other rights, uh, turned out to be impossible. And so after about 100 days, and hundreds of videos from doctors, therapists, advocates, and patients, uh, such as these. I, I wish I could play them, but essentially all they are is just saying, you know, Natasha here, uh, a nurse here in Victoria, saying, Minister, you know, my patients need access to psilocybin. If we have the right to die, surely you can grant compassion access so they can try. And that really, really hit home. We had tons of articles. Uh, let me see if there's. Yeah, we had tons of articles like all over the National Post, Forbes, McLean, still to this day, it's amazing to see the reach that this gets. Like the entire world is looking at Canada right now with our medical assistance and dying laws because we're probably the most progressive uh, country in the world and Vancouver Island is the most progressive, uh, probably healthcare jurisdiction in, within Canada. Um, I think this is where the most medical assistance in dying happens worldwide. It's really the epicenter for it. Um, so the fact that this started here, the fact that there were local, uh, you know, that there was so much local attention that really reverberated throughout the entire world, every other government jurisdiction thinking about this is looking at how it's happening here. So to put this criticism on it and to show some loopholes, uh, it really gained a ton of attraction. Um, and 
you know, that's really where it started. I think that's August 8th, 2020, right there. August 4th was the day that they got these the exemptions. Uh, and so after that, uh, the organization really took off. Um, the McKayan Foundation sent the organization, I think, just a hundred thousand dollar check after seeing that, uh, and really kickstarted what became the team. Um, you know, allowed us to bring on Yaz to start training, allowed us to bring on a nurse to start bringing in patients full time, um, allowed us to kick off research and stuff like that. Um, let me make sure I'm not skipping too too much. Uh, so that was October, sorry, August 4th of 2020. <coughs> in December of that same year, we made the same argument for healthcare professionals that if a patient is going to have access to psilocybin through this section 56, uh, then surely a doctor and therapist should as well. And the argument came from the best practices in psychotherapy, uh, and that is no therapist is going to deliver even massage therapy, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy without being subject to that therapy first, right? Understanding how it works. Uh, Bruce once said, you know, you wouldn't want to take skydiving lessons from someone who's never jumped out of a plane before. Uh, and I think that's true, right? You want there to be some sort of uh, understanding and empathy that's built into the psychotherapeutic relationship. Otherwise, you know, you're just taking this person's word that once you're, you know, in a severely altered state of consciousness, that's fine. Um, and for anyone who's tried psychedelics, I'm sure you can agree that you know, knowing that that person has been there is probably the most comforting fact, uh, you know, the, the most comforting thing possible. So the same thing happened. I think like maybe 10 or 12 therapists and doctors put together those videos and the minister this time knew exactly what was coming and how hard we pushed those videos. And after 60 days this time, so not 100, but 60 much faster, uh, the minister granted 19 healthcare practitioners exemptions for training purposes. I won't speak too much more on that because yes, there's a lot to say about it. Um, but it really got things going. And at that point in Canada, um, you know, we, that was under the leadership of Patty Haiju. Uh, Maid was really progressing and things were going really, really well. Um, unfortunately, around 2022, I think that would have been December or, or maybe the new year, maybe just the beginning of 2022, um, Patty Haiju was actually shifted within the government. So the last election we had, uh, she was moved out of power uh, and moved to Indigenous Affairs. And Johnny Duclos and Caroline Bennett came in and they really shut everything down, which is super unfortunate. Uh, these were two new health ministers, maybe didn't understand what psilocybin was, didn't have the same lobbying effort or advocacy effort pushed upon them. And for us, it really hit home and gave us a clear message. And that is that we need to change the regulations in this country because it shouldn't be up to you know whoever's in power that day or that week or that month to decide who gets access to their medicine who doesn't right who gets rights and who doesn't and so by doing that patty hive or sorry uh johnny de and caroline bennett created two classes of canadians <clears throat> those who get access to psilocybin and all of you who don't and that's what we wanted to fight and challenge so at that time, we had dropped the court case uh, when the first exemptions were granted. Uh, but right after that, right when they stopped, we realized, no, we have to push this all the way. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we cannot trust the government uh, to be doling these out of compassion. We need to change the laws in Canada. And so right around that same time, we actually wrote the regulations for psilocybin in Canada, psilocybin access. It's pretty much the same as the medical cannabis regulations, uh, and it would allow all of you access to medical psilocybin the same way you get access to medical cannabis with support of your doctor right not asking the minister of health and so really that's what we started fighting for uh, i won't go over that that's kind of the story um, so we've launched the court case that was launched in 2022 uh, and since then we've also been doing a ton of polls and i think polls are really important um, back to like cannabis, the reason that Justin Trudeau legalized cannabis, sorry, that's one of the big reasons they did, he didn't have to make it regulated or sorry, completely legalized um, and recreationalized the way he did, but the polls supported that. I think something like 90% of Canadians supported recreational cannabis, which is huge. It's, it's a landslide. 
have, but 59% is also a landslide. <coughs> Think of what 59% of Canadians agree on, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a single topic. Uh, but 59% of Canadians approve medical psilocybin regulations uh, for these people who you know, are treatment resistant. And that was back in 2020. 2021 jumped up to 66. At the end of 2022, it's at 80. Uh, it's probably time to do another poll now uh, because we'd probably be, you know, higher than that, especially when we pose the question, uh, you know, after this latest debate on medical assistance and done, which I will talk about maybe at the end. So yeah, you know, media coverage has been incredibly important. Uh, we've been doing a couple at uh, different events, such as Lobby Weeks in Ottawa. So we actually went to Ottawa with the help of Elizabeth May, who I'm sure many of us know, and then Alistair McGregor, who is a MP in North, Car North Carrollton or Duncan area. Um, they, or Alistair sits on the Joint Task Force Committee for Medical Assistance and Dying. So he's very close to the issue of MAID um, and ensuring that if we're going to have access to you know, uh, uh, drugs that would stop your heart, but surely you must have access to every other possible you know, substance that might be helpful before you get to that point. Um, so they hosted us in Ottawa, brought us there, and there was a ton of media coverage, but it really is that media coverage that we're looking for because it's really the only way to communicate with the ministers of health. Caroline Bennett and Johnny Duclo are still the only people that can help you know, the patients and, and healthcare practitioners who today are waiting on Section 56 exemptions um, in order to get access. There's also a judicial review happening, but that I will leave to you as. Um, and I think that is actually over to you now. Awesome. Thank you. And if anyone can't hear me, let me know. I can crank my voice up or put a mic on. But yeah, thanks, Spencer, for running us through the advocacy. And advocacy really encompasses our whole organization, including training. So our training program started back in 2021, March of 2021. It was launched and it started with advocacy. So once those patients received their exemption, the next step was to get trained healthcare professionals, like some of you, and their exemptions too, so they could experience psilocybin um, in a therapeutic context before treating these patients. So the problem to be solved was we need trained healthcare professionals in Canada to support these patients. And how, how can we do that? And really what it starts with is amplifying your voices. So we started by, here's Natasha again, a local nurse in BC. Um, we called on our healthcare professionals to grab their iPhones and send a video, a personal video to Patty Kaiju saying, Patty Kaiju, it's been three, four, five, six, seven, 90, 92, 93 days since my patient has had their exemption and I still do not have mine. And we really amplified the healthcare professionals' voices via our social platforms. We also amplified patient voices by saying, Minister, I've got my exemption, but my therapist does not have theirs. They need it, my doctor needs it, so they can understand what a psilocybin experience is like, so they can empathize with me and fully be with me. We also hosted plenty of webinars and IG Lives to educate the public. And we counted on our earned media partners as well. So they're still really, we've got a fantastic team. We've got an amazing community, but we also have fantastic earned media partners to help us amplify our voice. And once the healthcare professionals needed those exemptions, they really stood behind us. We also received lots of political and expert support. Spencer mentioned Elizabeth May, but also Rick Doblin, who some of you may know, Stan Groff, um, and Alistair McGregor stood behind us and, you know, went to Patty Kaiju and explained why we were really needing these exemptions. And as such, we received those exemptions on December 1st of 2020 for 19 healthcare professionals to use psilocybin in the course of training. And as a result, we then launched our training program in the beta stage just over two years ago on March 1st, 2020. And the Times Colonist, uh, Growth Up, Dale's Report all amplify our message. 
And so you'll see Natasha there again. Um, in May of 2021, we held the first legal experiential session in the course of our training program to show that, you know, Minister Canada public, it is safe for our doctors and therapists to use psilocybin. And actually it makes a huge impact on the treatment of patients. It is safer for them if we've got fully trained healthcare professionals. But that all stopped. So we assumed that a precedent was set back in December of 2020 that our other healthcare professionals would have the exact same rights as the ones who received their exemption back in December 2020. And so we launched this training program. We had three cohorts going in the data phase. And I just started with their self. And I was like, oh, okay, well, these exemptions must come true come through. They've just come back in December. Um, I'm sure they're going to come soon. And we were advocating, we were publishing lots of articles. We had the first experiential sessions in Canada, first legal ones in 50 years, and they all went really well. So we thought, what's what's the hold up? It's now been over two and a half years since we've gotten legal exemptions for healthcare professionals, and that's what we're really advocating for. And I'll talk about a judicial review in a little bit. So there are a few trainings in the room. Thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate your support. Um, but Therosol's training program has six components. It's quite rigorous. Right now it's 146 hours. It will be moving to 170 hours to get that practicum component. But what this looks like is we start out with three readings, then we move to the five day in person intensive session. So originally when we launched, it was in the middle of COVID. We, did, we tried on Zoom, it's just not the same. So we are now offering two cohorts um, per month across Canada. Um, and it's getting that in-person touch is really important. So all of our cohorts are maxed at 12 participants and they really allow for that in-person contact to create that safe container that's necessary to do this work because really what our training cohorts are is it's doing a lot of your own work and own processing because you can only really take your patients and clients as far as you're willing to go. So I think that's a really key differentiator between Therosol's training programs. Part three is our online webinars. And that's where we had the privilege of partnering with experts to do a little bit of a deeper dive on topics that are covered in the five day intensive but we want you to be able to go deeper. So we've had the absolute privilege of partnering with Jay Dahl, our clinical pharmacist on neurobiology and neuropharmacology. We have an ethics training module by Kylia Taylor, um, indigenous teachings by Dr. Duncan Grady and music training by Wave Paths. So those are all included on in training, but they're online. And I will also share that in that five day intensive, there is an experiential component where you will experience um, holotropic breathwork or conscious connected breathwork. And that's the opportunity for you to hopefully enter an altered state, state. And then you and your learning partner will switch roles so you get that hands-on experience of sitting, which is really, really important. Part four is where it gets a little trickier. We've got our experiential sessions and you know, I've seen a couple smiles coming from our trainees. Oh gosh, it's been so hard to move forward with that component. And so we have now, with the help, um, countless, countless hours of Nicholas Hope, who has done all his legal work pro bono for Theracil. Last Tuesday, we finally had our hearing. So we are now representing 100 healthcare professionals who were denied their exemptions. And we went from mandamus application to judicial review to then the hearing last Tuesday. And it sounds like we'll hear between two weeks to six months. I'm really crossing my fingers on the two weeks. Um, but we, we felt we really needed to push against them. We thought they'd grant all the exemptions, but they're pushing back. So we're very, very hopeful that from the evidence we've found in the judicial review process, which from Health Canada, their internal experts told their cell, or told their internal staff that a clinical trial was not appropriate for Theracil at that time. And Health Canada went against their internal experts. And so Nicholas thinks we've got probably an 85% chance of winning that case, in which case hopefully we'll have experiential um, sessions for all trainees that are legal. 
Another thing we're exploring is a potential clinical trial, um, and that will open up, you know, there's 200 spots. We've got a no objection letter in partnership with an amazing physician we've worked with, and that will be another legal route. But our hope is, of course, that the regulations that Spencer and John have been advocating for, as well as the countless healthcare professionals, will go through, and not only patients, but healthcare professionals will also receive a paid supply of psilocybin for treatment and training purposes. And then the last part is supervision. So once you've completed your experiential module and are working with patients, we ask that you do a minimum of 10 hours of supervision. And that's really for your safety as well as the safety of the patients. And then the final step, my favorite step, is community and care and practice. We don't want anyone lone wolfing this. We want you to be supported by the community. This is not work we should be doing alone. When, when you take psychedelics, there's so, so much at stake. Everything is amplified. And so having that community to lean back into is absolutely crucial. So we've got, to this point, we've trained about 400 healthcare professionals. We've got an amazing community of patients and supporters, and they are all living on Mighty Networks. And we post updates on what's happening in the space, the legal space, as well as all of the fun training materials are there. And so just an overview of the training program to date and what's been accomplished in two years, thanks to the Nikayan Foundation and our amazing team. Um, we've moved our training program out of beta. We've moved it from online to in-person. We've delivered 33 training cohorts, our 34th being next week. And we've trained over 400 healthcare professionals in Canada and have recently expanded to the States. And it sounds like we might be expanded to Australia, so fingers crossed. Um, and we've supported patient access and treatment. We've got about 1,300 healthcare professionals on our wait list to be trained. And we, now that the SAP has been amended, um, it's very clear that we need training. So back when Jean-Yves Duclos came into office, last January 5th, 2022, he amended the special access program for doctors and nurse practitioners to be able to apply for special access for their patients. And when that came out, it was a key message to Spencer and I that training is absolutely crucial. We can't just have doctors applying for special access and then sending them to any therapist who doesn't have their own psychedelic experience. So when it was amended, it was a very slow process. It felt like it was blocking access until very recently when our lawyer, Nicholas Hope, got involved. So as of right now, in the last month, they're still supported about 15 patients in accessing psilocybin under the special access program. But what's really unfortunate is it's a pay-to-play system. So anytime Health Canada pushes back, for example, in December, they reached out to our doc, one of our doctors that we work with, and they said, you know, your patients, have, four patients have not tried electric convulsive therapy. Yeah, not, not great. And we went to the media and CBC amplified that message and Health Canada called us the day after apologizing and then granted the exemptions a few days later. So it's not that Health Canada is bad per se. They are compassionate individuals, but we need a better system because what they're still doing right now thanks to Nicholas Hope, who's doing all the work pro bono, is any time we don't receive an exemption approval within two days, we file a mandamus and we get the court system involved. And so now there's a more steady trickle in of patients. And another milestone, what we've realized with the special access program is some doctors aren't feeling that they have the tools to successfully um, apply for special access. The system's quite onerous. It's an eight-page document. Ours is now 15 pages because we've templated it. Um, and so we launched the prescriber training for doctors and nurse practitioners back in February. And this really gives them the tools that are necessary to apply for special access, goes over the contraindications, neurobiology, and all the studies. And so that was a big success. So we're launching another one on June 12th and another one on August 25th. And what's next? One other exciting milestone was that two doctors um, on our training committee recently received um, full coverage from start to finish um, in Quebec through RAMQ, which is our equivalent of the medical services plan. 
So the government in Quebec fully covered the whole psilocybin experience for two doctors under their government plan. So what's next? We're going to continue advocating for increased coverage under our insurance plans. We will continue offering a minimum of two trainings per month. We will expand prescriber-specific training. And we're hopefully going to get some treatment hubs going, Victoria being probably the second one that's going to offer the second group treatment um, through Theracil, hopefully. Um, because there's a lot of patients in Victoria who are aware of, of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. So really expanding group treatment. and. We're really advocating for a regulated doctor as a gatekeeper model to psilocybin. And I'll pass it back to Spencer regarding our two legal cases to make this all happen. Thank you, guys. Yeah, what's up? Uh, I'm curious if Quebec has psychotherapy covered under provincial Pardon? Does Quebec have psychotherapy covered under provincial uh, medical services? They don't, but their doctors can apply for a psychotherapy license by doing a little bit more education. Yeah. So one of the doctors who receive coverage is also a psychotherapist and a psychotherapist, another is a palliative physician. Yeah. Awesome. So as Yaz uh, spoke about, there there is not only the charter challenge, but there's also the judicial review. Um, Again, the Charter Challenge is, let's just say, the really big one, right? It's trying to change an entire piece of our uh, Committee of Drugs and Controlled Substances, um, what would you call that, I guess, regulations. Uh, and it's trying to make uh, this massive change for all of you because we all fall under that Charter of Rights and Freedoms. What applies to Thomas and Lori applies to all of you. Uh, it's really that fairness, that equality. Uh, that we're trying to achieve through the Charter Challenge. And that thing's going to take a couple of years. It's a beast of a challenge. Uh, so far to date, we've probably fundraised about $100,000 for it. Um, we're hoping to start up this year another fundraiser uh, to get another $100,000. So if any of you feel like doing some fundraising, definitely hit us up after as we need it. Uh, I will mention too that 100% of the funds that are fundraised through that go to the legal team. Uh, to fund that case. So, you know, there are lots of organizations out there, nonprofits uh, that fundraise. A lot of the time, you know, sometimes only 50 cents in the dollar goes to, uh, you know, the, the cause that it's trying to support. In this case, 100%. So, we definitely want to tout that, let everyone know that that's going to be a, you know, quite a big issue. Um, right now, in the case, we are just getting together all of our uh, expert witnesses. So, people like Roland Griffiths, like David Nutt. Paul Sammons, uh, these industry experts that we all know of, uh, ensuring that they're able to come and actually testify, provide their statements is super important. It's also kind of expensive sometimes because you got to fly people out, buy their time and stuff. Um, but nonetheless, we're doing that. A lot of them are working pro bono, a lot of the lawyers are working pro bono as well. Um, and then the second one is that judicial review. And so again, all we're doing is trying to ask the Minister of Health why they've departed from the original decision to grant exemptions. Uh, and that's really important is anytime you know a minister makes a decision, you do have to provide justification for departure from an original decision. Uh, the reason being, you know, it can't just be the flavor of the day depending on the minister. Um, equally important in there too is we, through the process of getting documents from Health Canada, did find some pretty troubling documents, uh, one of which being Health Canada's own experts saying that a clinical trial wouldn't be possible uh, for the purpose of training healthcare practitioners. Um, and at the same time, you know, their officials are denying and saying you should do clinical trials. Um, so it's really not that possible. What you would have to do and what we're still trying to do is do a clinical trial for treatment, but for actual training purposes, that's not possible. Another one too was their own experts admitting that psilocybin was both safe and effective and then them coming back and saying that for safety reasons, we can't grant this. Um, so, you know, this does kind of expose some of the dysfunctions of Health Canada. Um, it's not something we're proud of or want to tote too much, uh, but it is an issue. And I think by pushing these cases, these challenges forward, um, you know, it is a way to bypass a bureaucracy that sometimes gets stuck and acts more politically motivated than, you know, compassionately motivated or motivated by our charter rights and freedoms, which it should be. Um, something that's not on here that I really do want to add to 
Uh, did anyone hear about the expansion to medical assistance in dying that was supposed to be uh, expanded on March 17th? Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. Uh, if anyone didn't know, May right now is really only accessible for people. Uh, I think there are some loose exceptions, but for whom that is foreseeable. Uh, so you have to be uh, actively dying. And again, it's hard to qualify or quantify that because we're all dying. In a way, we're all terminal. Uh, but it needs to be something that's irreversible, irremediable, right? Uh, you're dying and you can't, you can't reserve or reverse that. Um, however, uh, I think it was about within the last two years, um, the government made some changes and realized that there are actually people who are suffering irremediably uh, when they're dying, they don't know. Uh, but they might have serious treatment-resistant depression or anxiety or be in severe pain. Uh, and there are many people like this in Canada, people with cluster headaches, people with serious treatment-resistant depression, uh, who have been like that for years and want the right to die. And so that was actually granted. And the government put together this committee, uh, Alistair McGregor, who we were talking about, was one of the eight members on that committee. And they actually asked both myself and one of our board members, Valerie Masuda, to come speak to the committee uh, on Parliament. And we both gave very similar reports, right? We both have clients, in Valerie's case, palliative care doctor, patients, uh, who are actively dying, but also those who are not actively dying. Uh, that may very soon, or uh, most certainly under the new proposed regulations, have the right to die uh, for a treatment that, or for a condition that could be treated with psilocybin. And that was really the issue, right? With one hand, the government is offering someone the right to die with medical assistance in dying, which you know, whether or not you support that is something that our Charter of Rights and Freedom supports. And they're saying that you're able to have that because you are treatment resistant, because there are no treatments that can help you. And with this hand, they're holding back the treatments that can help you. And so that's what we're really now trying to fight and get ahead of. Now, maybe not luckily, but for whatever reason, the government extended that deadline. It was supposed to be March 17th that that was going to come into effect. Uh, there was an outrage, and if any of you saw the news, there were stories about veterans being offered medical assistance and dying, people who had housing issues or drug addiction looking towards May because nothing else was working. And so, obviously, we start having questions, you know, you have to start questioning things like do the social determinants of health, right, access to health care, affect someone's choice in choosing medical assistance and dying? The answer is certainly. So, this committee took our reports uh, and they actually put together a set of recommendations and I encourage you all to go look it up a uh, special joint task force on medical assistance and dying report it's a mouthful but recommendation nine right yeah yeah nine actually encourages the government to look into regulations for psilocybin and to also immediately expand the SAP program to allow these people access to psilocybin so that's our own government's committees suggesting to our health ministers that they open up access to psilocybin to essentially remedy that issue. Uh, so we now have a government that is really stuck, right? Digging their heels in, who could do the democratic thing and listen to their own government, listen to the people, the charter rights and freedoms, and act appropriately, but instead would rather have drank their feet. And so that's really part of the reason that our organization exists. I like to hope that's part of the reason that MAPS exists too, right? Like we can all be advocates uh, for the way that we want drug policy to operate in this country. And the only way to do that is to you know, put your voice out there and to make demands because the government is there to govern this country. It is not there to act quickly and it's not there to be proactive. It really requires lots and lots of work from people uh, to move things forward. All you've got to do is understand whether or not that thing is possible. And in this instance, psilocybin is certainly possible. It's on track. We're getting there. Um, so both the judicial review and the charter challenge uh, perhaps are the uh, the way I like to think of it. It's kind of like the back pocket. We're pushing as far as we can. Uh, the government is going to have to grant those judicial review exemptions, um, but they don't need to, right? As Yaz was saying, it could take two weeks, it could take six weeks or six months, or the Minister of Health could step in and say, whoa, 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 this is clearly wrong. We can just remedy this today and that's really what we're asking for and so we certainly ask all of you for a little bit of help there those videos that we were showing you 
um, you know, putting your voice out there, saying, you know, I'm a university student, or I'm a doctor, or I'm a therapist, I'm a nurse, etc. I want to see, or even just a concerned citizen, or I have a family member, anything like that. Uh, it starts getting viral on Instagram, on Facebook, TikTok. That stuff really goes the distance, uh, and it encourages the minister to respond because it really is their obligation to respond, but only if it's a real pain in their ass. And so that's what we want to be, is we want to be that pain. Uh, and universities historically in Canada have been amazing uh, at you know leading social change. Uh, so that's kind of what we're hoping to do. I think we had talked with us previously about running similar lobby weeks here in Victoria. Um, I think that would be incredibly powerful. There are a lot of people in the city who care a lot about social justice, who care a lot about healthcare, medical assistance and dying, and want to see these things accessible. So my hope is that we'll move there and that we'll see a solution to this judicial review. And if we're lucky, the charter challenge too, because it really just takes one stroke of a pen from our minister to clear all of this up and to grant all of you your right to psilocybin. Um, I think we've gone through a pretty good legal update here. And that might bring us to questions. Uh, so please, there are no silly questions. Let's have a little discussion because I think we still got all the time. Yeah. Go for it. Is there, is there a cell phone on the wall? Yes. Okay. Um, can we speak after for some reason? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just comment right now quick, like our fundraising historically has, uh, you know, really been like philanthropists, people coming out, coming to our website and signing up um, as a small team uh, that works really hard to fund the organization through training and through other avenues. Uh, we don't always dedicate the most time to fundraising. So really, the more people to get involved in that, the better. Uh, it was obviously a lot easier to fundraise back in 2020. The economy was booming. There's a huge psychedelic industry that was kind of channeling us uh, money, making this all very, very possible. Um, but today that's a bit more challenging. So if any of you are able to help out with fundraising, uh, you know that would be incredibly helpful for the organization, but more importantly for the patients and legal team uh, who would receive all of those funds and who are pushing that forward. Thank you for the presentation. I'm just curious to know, like, what's the breakdown of the health Yeah, absolutely. So I would say there's probably, now that we've got prescriber training as well, there's probably 120 physicians, probably 200 therapists, and then maybe 100 nurses. And then in terms of eligibility criteria, we require that you're a medical professional, um, so doctor, nurse, or therapist, with um, who belongs to a professional college with a code of ethics, and that you, if you are a therapist, that you've got a master's level accreditation. <coughs> In terms of that, and that's really so you can move from provisional status to associate status, and then nurses or folks with um, who don't have clinical experience, they are generally co-sitters in the space and doctors are generally prescribers. There's of course different um, workarounds for some things, but that's generally speaking. And then we also have two spots in each training for um, spiritual practitioners who are credentialed. So ordained ministers, um, pastors, or um, ordained ministers, which is very easy to get online for anyone who wants nice and cool. Yeah. <laughs> What would like an ordained minister to be a co-sitter capacity um, for anyone who's experienced spirit, um, psilocybin? It's a very spiritual experience, generally speaking. Um, and so all of our patients are supported with a two-to-one model for individual therapy. So generally, spiritual practitioners would act as a co-sitter. They'd be in that last preparation session. They'd be there for the full dosing session and that first integration session, but they're not doing the therapy with the client. Yeah. Um, I'm just not familiar with you know, the, the drug and how it's delivered. How do you dose it? Yeah. So right now through the SAP, 
program, it's through capsules. Um, many people would rather a raw mushroom, but if you want legal access right now, it's through the special access program and it's a synthetic compound. So it's in a pill format. Okay. Um, if you're not using it in a legal above ground way, which is very common and very nice um, as well. And you would have maybe a raw mushroom with, or a tea preparation. And that's yeah. generally- But in your case, in your training case, when you're delivering it- Synthetic, yep. Synthetic. Yep. yep. And we're trying to advocate for full mushroom use um, because of the ceremonial aspect. Is it psilocybin or psilocybin in the capsules? Psilocybin. It is psilocybin still, because you were using a different number. You're comparing to a five gram of a mushroom versus twenty five. Yeah. Gram of yeah. yeah. Of psilocybin, where five grams of whole mushrooms. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not sure about this, but I believe that psilocybin converts into psilocybin mm -hmm. yes. in the in the body. Mm -hmm. How much of that? I don't know, but but I think you can also. I've seen the companies have psilocybin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. I was curious with that number there when you go psilocybin versus other whole mushrooms. Yeah, it depends on the percentage. If it's 0 0.05 or 0 0.1 of psilocybin in the content, right now we're working primarily with filament health, which is actually a botanical extract, and Psygen, which is a synthetic compound. And your training um, gives CE credits to the healthcare professional? So we've got CE credits for our 146 hour training program for through the CPA and CCPA, so psychologists as well as therapists. And then for prescriber training, we've got six hours of CME credits. Um, can you speak, I don't know if it's something you can speak to, but it's like kind of the general state of research in Canada. Like, is it something that if researchers want to research, they're required to apply for the same special exemption? Or are there clinical trials running here? And kind of what is the process and what legal bodies that go through the researchers to be able to run studies on cell science? Yeah, sure. I can I can comment on that. So, you know, research that's being done right now, let's say within the psychedelic field or psilocybin field, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of, you know, MAPS. Uh, obviously, that's working with MDMA, and the whole point of that is to bring your drug product to market. And so when you're creating research for, you know, a drug product, it's uh, really nice if, like MAPS, you can get $30 million in funding uh, to run that program, because then you can justify selling a drug very cheaply. Now, as many of us know, a lot of pharmaceuticals are very expensive because of the amount of effort and work that goes into research and development. So I don't know how much, um, you know, like Compass Pathways will charge for their psilocybin. Um, has anyone heard? Okay, good. I'm okay, but, but they could theoretically charge, you know, whatever they want. Now, that's for a drug product. The drug product can be prescribed because it's prescribed in Canada, very likely be covered by uh, you know, or, or by our healthcare system. Um, right now in Canada, I don't know of many companies that are very far along. Um, there are a lot in development. So like Apex Labs, I know of, is working on a product, I'm sure Optimize is as well. Um, but in general, psilocybin is very hard to patent because what you're going to come out with uh, is gonna have to compete with mushrooms. And so a company putting up the necessary amount of money, maybe $30 million, uh, to run a clinical trial on a substance that, you know, after years of investigation might yield a drug for treatment-resistant depression, um, would also have to contest the fact that you could go down the street and buy it at Zoomers and do it with your therapist, right? So the cost might be $3,000 for that drug, uh, but it's only 30 bucks down at Zoomers. Uh, and we know from cannabis that this was one of the issues that led to the lack of research in cannabis, right? That's why we don't have many prescription cannabinoids. Uh, it's because most people just prefer to use the flour to smoke it, ingest the oils, and they're able to do that, uh, you know, rather safely uh, and without a ton of research. So there is this really fine balance, uh, you know, trying to find the, uh, let's say, market motivation to bring a psilocybin product to market. And that's part of our legal challenge is explaining to the government that you know it's not as easy as going out and fundraising $50 million uh, because you can't guarantee a return to your investors. And so there's that issue there, right? The shareholder value doesn't exist in a company that uh, is competing with a, you know, a guy on the street who's selling mushrooms. Uh, 
So what we're trying to do now is launch a clinical trial, um, much to our dismay, we didn't really want to, uh, but it seems like we may have to. Um, the problem is that clinical trial still might not be for bringing, you know, a psilocybin drug product to market. If, if it was, and maybe it will be, you know, if we can get a lot of money, it'd be great to run a clinical trial uh, and do all the research and then show that psilocybin works and just leave it up path to the dope so anyone can access it. Uh, but it looks like that's going to be quite difficult. So instead, we might just run a clinical trial for access. Uh, and so we would be using clinical trials as a mode of access for patients and healthcare practitioners, which is unethical. <laughs> and that's part of our argument is, you know, this charter rights and freedoms that gave us access to cannabis didn't, you know, it didn't get there uh, by accident, right? It didn't get there because clinical trials were available or clinical trials were done, were done independent of these clinical trials. It doesn't matter what the research says, right? There's, there's two kinds of methods of thought here. Where are the clinical trials that show that cannabis is effective or that abortion is effective or that made is effective or that alcohol, you know, actually the opposite there is it's actually dangerous. Yet we still have these inherent rights to these things. So, you know, it's, it's going to be, we will be hard pressed to get the clinical trials maybe that we, we need. Um, and there will be some clinical trials for, you know, certain products and, and those will be fantastic. I mean, as an organization, we really support those. Mm -hmm. Any clinical trials that can be done are amazing because research, as you saw, is, is one of our pillars. We want to continue that. Uh, but it will be difficult. And so we really are looking at a clinical trial. We haven't done too much to announce it yet. Uh, but there will be one, hopefully, if we can figure out the resources and team and, and get it together. Um, so again, if anyone here is interested in that, hit us up. Uh, we would love to have some help on it because it really will take, you know, the entire organization and I think our network as well to make that possible. Uh, and with the right amount of resources, we would be able to actually run the clinical trials necessary to make psilocybin not only decriminalized or legalized in the country, but actually prescribed both and covered by, by our insurance and by, by public health care. Yeah. Do you want to add just, anything? Just that? adding on the decriminalization part that you just shared, it, it, it's not really lining up because in Vancouver, for anyone who's from Vancouver, maybe not, but there's probably five or six dispensaries that they have no intent on shutting down. I'm sure Victoria is next up for the next dispensary. Just, just open. Just yeah. open. Just open. <laughs> okay, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Where is it? Okay, got it. So you got one. <laughs> but it's just, it doesn't really line up. They're, they won't grant exemptions, but they've said we're not going to shut down, um, in Vancouver at least, these um, mushroom dispensaries. So there's a misalignment in messaging too from our government. Yeah, and, and that really is something that like kind of proves or justifies the argument that we're making is, you know, like if this was so bad, so dangerous, wouldn't you shut down the shops? And the answer is they won't. Uh, and it's because they know that we're right. They know that the constitutional challenge that would come out of them prosecuting these shop owners uh, would land them in the same place, legal regulations. And that's why the cannabis source also remained open is uh, they actually can't prosecute. The only thing they could do is regulate and then they can shut them down. So what I've heard is they actually go into those mushroom shops and they go, you guys are selling any cannabis in the area. No, okay, continue to operate. And that's the way they work. So, you know, we should be infuriated by this because there's a word for that and it's called mismanagement or bad governance. And that's what's happening right now within the province and within the country. Uh, and that affects all of us, right? It gives us lower quality drugs and substances to use. And there's a huge push obviously on the West Coast for that. So, you know, what I'm hoping we can do is, you know, partner with universities like UVEC and with students and organizations and go right to the provincial legislator and say this is unacceptable, right? We demand more from our politicians that are making drug policy. Uh, and in a way, get the shit or get off the pot, right? Give us access or, or don't and actually enforce the laws. But this middle ground is, I think, really dangerous. It's a, it's a bad spot to be in and something that we should, we should demand more of. I think when it comes to the whole issue of um, democratic access for everybody, one of my biggest concerns, I mean, obviously you've got to start at the federal level, but when you bring it down to the individual health ministers, 
provincially too, because for instance, I'm already um, on a legalized drug. I'm on insulin mm -hmm. for diabetes. Mm -hmm. And what it costs me to use that as a life support mm -hmm. drug here in BC is radically different from what it would cost in Ontario. In Ontario, uh, stuff I have to pay for here just to stay alive, there I get for free. And so I have a real concern not to add to the yeah. world, you know, to bring more challenges to you. But I, and that's a huge concern, I think, too, with the provincial level and the health minister level there. You know, uh, will it be more accessible uh, based on geography to certain Canadians than it is to others? You bring up such a good point. I don't know if anyone saw the Alberta regulations that were passed and once again, misalignment from reporters saying psilocybin is legalized in Alberta. Well, it's not because it's at a federal level, but if we get regulations at a federal level, now it's already hard to have a doctor and a therapist. It's very costly for working with our treatment hubs to try to bring these costs down through treatment. But Alberta has put all of the model through a clinic space and under um, the guidance of a psychiatrist. So one, psychiatrists have an 18 month wait list. Two, they're very expensive. And to limit it only to psychiatrists will then be limiting access. So that's something once regulations come out, we're gonna really have to work on as an organization to make sure access at a provincial level is accessible for everyone and that what's happening in Quebec can also happen over here. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, and and I'll just add even a little tiny bit more on that. Is like we're working right now at the federal level. We really don't have the resources to be working and, and, and putting in as much effort at the provincial level as we should. We're going to start that. I think we're going to start it here first. And you know, yeah, as I am just today, we're talking about bringing our next lobby week to Victoria, mm -hmm. because without that, we may very well, you know, uh, get what we want at the federal level. But if as local BC citizens, right? If we don't put in the, the work necessary to lobby, uh, you know, David Eby and Jennifer Whiteside, our Minister of Mental Health and Addictions here, uh, then Adrian Dix, Adrian Dix yeah. <laughs> if, if they don't know exactly what's going on, uh, and the only person that comes to them is, you know, some uh, very money motivated individual with a clinic or something like that, that gives them, you know, a kind of breakdown, then we will run into a situation where similarly like in Alberta, uh, you know, 1% of the population might have access to it. Uh, and that's, yeah, I think that's kind of unacceptable. So again, really like VAPS has the ability to be that leader in the space. We would love to get in touch with like the EBC, Psychedelic Society, the universities is where that stuff starts. And the same goes for any healthcare practitioners in the province, like writing letters, making sure that if it ever came to it, you could point back and be like, no, I was actually ignored, right? We, we put up the recommendations, you ignored us. Um, all that stuff is defensible, uh, so long as we put in the effort. So uh, as an organization, obviously we're balancing lots of things, but that's one of the, the very important ones is ensuring that, you know, uh, that that work is done because someone clearly did that work in, in Ontario, right? To make it, make it extremely accessible. Um, hopefully we can do the same here in BC. So I hear you talk a lot about getting to this point, but in terms of like post-treatment and integration, like is there something being developed or organized once people have passed the post in terms of maintaining and like creating a sense of community after the fact? Yeah. Do you mean integration in general? Integration in general. Finding your community after. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one thing that we are looking towards is group treatment hubs. The first one launched in um, Ottawa on February 11th. And going through a group model, one makes it more accessible, but you also have that community that you prepare with, you do the dosing with, and the integration work with. So you've got not only your healthcare team that's with you the whole time, but you've got new friends, you've got a new community. So we are really trying to pivot towards group sessions. And originally it was to bring the cost down for patients and clients, but looking at the research, 
it's also having that community, as you say, to go through the whole process with, and essentially lifelong friends to not only integrate for three sessions, but to keep talking about that experience or when you do another dose the year after to, to have that community to fall back on because that's what's needed to make the lasting change. If you don't ex integrate an experience properly, you'll likely lose all of the messages within a six month period. So having that constant discourse is really important. And that's where our community of care and practice is also really, really important to plug people in. So, you know, if someone is doing their experience in Ontario, but they've got some sort of connection to someone in BC, an emotional connection, they can they can also connect by that platform. So trying to do things there. So patients that are approved for like the treatment, because that's been the case, what's been the average cost, the total cost for like About 3,500 to 5,000. Very expensive. That being said, if you have extended medical, once again, that's a privilege, then your prep and integration sessions could be coverage, covered under extended health, or in fact, they've just covered that first patient. And really where like research can help with that too, is like, I'm sure we can all think of, you know, people who have done psilocybin, all of a sudden they're going back to work or, you know, they're, they're feeling better and off of a lot of other medications is our hope and really what we're trying to push towards is showing the government why they should be paying for this because I think it pays for itself, you know, even five, even if it was $10,000, you know, it paid for itself times and times over. We did a small project a couple of years ago where we were helping a couple of people with um, severe opioid addiction and we were able to get a couple of them back to work. And I know on the downtown east side, there was a stat I heard that like each person costs the city of Vancouver about $100,000 a year. So if you think of like if a ten thousand dollar therapy, obviously there'd be a lot more work um, that might be necessary. But even spending a hundred thousand dollars on something that could be eighty percent effective or sixty percent effective becomes a, makes a lot more sense. So we're trying to find ways to convince the government that you know for a lot of people five thousand dollar one time treatment could be just the absolute most affordable and best investment uh, they ever make. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in the work that you're doing, which is like really commendable. And I think I don't think people realize what you could do in terms of health patients. As a medical doctor, I will just share one thing with you. And I mean it's just simply it's very controversial, it's not um, black and white, and I don't have as much I'm just sharing with you. So I'm an anesthesiologist, and since cannabis has been legalized, we're finding patients are coming in that are using it very, very regularly. And so what we're finding is two things that I, I just want to share with you for thought, so just you know, just take it as you like. One thing is, as 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 physicians providing anesthesia care, we unless you're like a new grad being taught now, we're a bit behind in our teaching and even in our own, you know, clinical medical education as to how to figure out how much people are taking. We're also finding people that are using it regularly, even though it's legalized and being safe. It is affecting like how we're delivering anesthetics and what they're requiring, um, how they're waking up in terms of their amount of analgesia, pain control, anxiety. So, it, you know, um, it's frustrating when the government does things that are mismatched and that are kind of being silly. But it's okay to, to try lightly because we're already finding with legalized cannabis there's been so many changes for us as care providers and we just kind of roll with it and do the best we can but the knowledge isn't quite there and you know so i'm just sharing yeah that. that's helpful yeah. thank you yeah. it's a really good point that and part of why like you know we're kind of like oh, we don't want to run this clinical trial but then at the same time like our board and we know we should is that research is so important because it's, it's so easy just to do the you know the route of uh like charter rights and say that we don't need the research, it's safe. Um, but right, as taxpayers, we're all we're all speaking about a medical system that in the past has really been uh, you know affected by drugs that came out with lack of research, right? And that affects all of us. It affects it affects people. I mean, cannabis use disorder is a thing too, right? Like there there are people who abuse it. Back to that, there's no safe drug. So I think that's where we're you know now that we've got a clinical trial that's possible. We're kind of thinking like you know with the government recent announcement of i think it's like a billion dollars over the next three years to look into new solutions for mental health addiction 
like maybe we really should be going after them and saying like not only should we be looking into regulations for psilocybin but like you know how about a hundred million dollars in research over a couple of years so that we can better understand it because we know we're getting there but the responsible thing to do just like we've kind of set up our our mission the, the pillars is like if we're going to legalize something we got to do research on it there are lots of people who are very keen to do that um, but if it's going to be done it's going to need a significant amount of money to, to you know cover some of these exact issues because even as a team at there so we we don't always know what's going to happen when people take psilocybin with their ssris or, or with their you know uh, with the many different drugs that they might be on um, so research you're absolutely right it's like ridiculously important and and I hope something we can do better this time uh, around. Yeah, so well, first off, um, yeah, tons of great points. I just want to add a couple things to that. So, like, I, I really thank you guys. I feel like you're very conservative in how you present things. And honestly, I don't know how you stay so well headed through some of this because, like, I'm involved in research and reading studies on psilocybin. Like, if any other substance had the same level of efficacy, then it would be pushed through and would be legal. And, like, some of the evidence that's come out is so compelling. To me, I, I just have to ask you guys, like, where do you think all the resistance comes from? Like, is it just that people don't know, or is it is it just like a legal situation in the government there? Like just with things like the fact that like now um, possession of I think it's under two grams of substances like MDMA, like things like um, I think it was like heroin and other things like that are now decriminalized here in BC. The fact that psilocybin wasn't included in that, and the fact that there's so much resistance is just absolutely mind boggling to me. Like it feels like there's almost some sort of hubris going on. Like I just can't. Of all the evidence that there is, especially things going on in Europe and stuff too, and the fact we've made all this, it's like, what on earth is going on? And, and just adding on that, the reason psilocybin wasn't included in that is because it's so safe. So they are not concerned about it at all. So that that's just one point to add. But. Yeah, they're not arrested on the basis of possession for psilocybin. Mm -hmm. no. No. I'll, I'll like speak in theories because I, I don't necessarily know. I mean, so I've been a registered lobbyist now for three years. I've gotten a really good idea of how lobbying works. Um, certainly one possibility is any companies that are building a drug for psilocybin, uh, you know, there could be billions of dollars at stake. Uh, that's just the companies that are making psilocybin products, let alone the companies for whom psilocybin may offer a replacement. Uh, so pharmaceutical companies that provide SSRIs for which patients are using psilocybin to get off of, uh, again, when you think of the, the potential revenue there, like you start thinking of trillions. And so it becomes what would what would they do? So if you look at, you know, the World Economic Forum or some of these environmental organizations, or sorry, in Egypt, I know there was a, a large event, 600 oil lobbyists went there and essentially, uh, you know, axed any uh, ability for any of the conference, uh, you know, participants to get anywhere. Uh, so lobbying is a real thing, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical industry uh, has a lot at stake with ensuring that, you know, something that's free and maybe used one time doesn't replace a lot of pills. Now, I, I realize you kind of sound like a conspiracy theorist when you say that, but, <laughs> but I, I don't think it's far from the truth. Uh, and I realize, you know, I think of like the Jung kind of like shadow is like, I could be tempted if, with a trillion dollars to do the same thing and to push it down. I like money crops out everybody and, and absolute power crops all. So I think it's possible that that's happening. Uh, and just really quickly, like for anyone who hasn't tried psilocybin in the room, like maybe they'll make money off their microdosing kits because there is a high margin there. That's probably their best chance. If anyone here has done five grams of mushrooms, you're not doing it for a year, two years, three years. You're, you're, you're just not. You will do a dose once a year, and five grams of mushrooms cost $35. So it's just like adding on yeah. to your point. It's... Yeah. And so, yeah, like that's the, that's the business decision, right? And, and that's a real threat. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. And for a long time, you know, that, that pharmaceutical industry uh, has got a pretty bad track record if you look back at some of the Case, I think the biggest lawsuit ever settled in the world like history was over Oxycontin. So uh, it's the same people giving us our SSRIs and, and all of these substances that, uh, you know, to many of the doctors that we work with, in their opinion, keep people sick. Uh, whereas psilocybin actually gets to the underlying, underlying root cause. Uh, so that's a really, a real possibility. And then the one other that I'll just mention is, 
uh, I know it sounds crappy, but not many people know about psilocybin or care that much. Uh, a lot of them really just see it as, you know, uh, something that you know, might work, might not. Uh, many people just are happy doing it themselves. Things do not pass in this country uh, without a significant amount of social uh, social energy behind it. And so when we think of, you know, how the Liberal government really operates, and this is no surprise, it's been well documented for the last like 50 years, is it's like a PR company. Uh, so unless your issue is the top thing, uh, there's no way you're going to look at it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's where it needs to land is on Justin Trudeau's desk, on Minister uh, Duclos' desk. So we can totally get past those lobbyists. You know, the, the court of law will do that. Um, but the best shot really is, is to make this a voting issue because it doesn't matter how much money the lobbyists have. If the government's going to lose a vote over an issue like this, uh, you know, they'll find their money elsewhere. So really this attention, like having BAPS, having all of you, right, working to make this, you know, these people, uh, their voices heard, the patients and therapists and doctors, uh, that'll get us there. But unfortunately, we don't have enough support right now uh, in order to overcome, let's say, the, the political stagnation on the issue. And one final thing, there's still tons of stigma. I think we need to remind ourselves in BC, we are living in a different world here. If you go over <laughs> to the, yeah, it's very, very different here. So this conversation likely wouldn't be happening as easily on the East Coast, in the prairies. There are some amazing advocates there, but it's really, really not the same as this little bubble we've got going on here. And they're still thinking about what happened in the 60s and 70s. So once again, it's educating, <coughs> advocating, having the conversations, sharing your experiences of, you know, my microdosing experience was really positive. I'm feeling a bit calmer, whatever it may be, um, to open up those channels for other people. And just one more comment. You said the word conservative too, and it's like, it's actually true. I've been advised not to say this, but I will. Is like we do have the conservative stance on this. Is like right now it's chaos, right? Anyone can produce, buy, sell psilocybin. Like we actually have a conservative regimen for this, a regulatory regime called the APMPR, Access to Psilocybin for Medical Purposes Regulations. It's a conservative mm -hmm. solution to right now what is liberal chaos. So. Uh, we actually are trying to do something that conservatively will help people uh, access this through their doctors and therapists. Uh, first of all, yes, and Spencer, I commend you on the passion and energy that you bring to the leadership and advocacy for the whole 30 Thursday community. And then this job is passionate for me, a high emphasis on the professionalism. So I had a question that arose out of attending the Harvard Medical School um, two-day conference in February on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And just like you're saying that uh, psilocybin is likely to be approved in Canada in the not too distant future with the work of the um, lawyers that are acting on this. They were saying that MDMA is close to that in the U.S. and it has some uh, particular benefits for those with PTSD. I'm wondering if Theracell has had discussions about whether they're likely to include more than uh, psilocybin in the treatment protocols because of ketamine uh, uh, and now um, MDMA possibly becoming a not to just in future. And how is Theracell foreseen interfacing with uh, the other agents that are used for psychedelic assistance? It's a really good question. And at this point in time, like we kind of focused on psilocybin, um, have always had our, our, our sights set on it. But that was, you know, a decision that was made at a different time. And so as other psychedelics become available, I, I think there's a bit of an obligation for us to re reassess that um, and to act not as like, you know, a dictatorship, but as a democracy. So. I would personally love to be able to put that out to our stakeholders. We've got an AGM coming up pretty soon. Uh, and I do want that to be like a topic for the new year. It's like, is that something that our board wants, right? And I think the board should be informed by what the stakeholders want, right? That's kind of the, the correct way that that should flow. So I, I would just say, 
personally, not on behalf of the organization. And I think that's a wicked idea. I think it'd be really awesome to do the training. Um, I'll let you ask for speaking. Yeah, about it I think it's such a good point, Ian, because MDMA on its own or MDMA in in um, with psilocybin can be so powerful, especially just to open the heart a bit for having you know the light and dark of psilocybin. Um, as Spencer said, to date we're just staying in our lane and hoping that we can push these regulations for it, but it is a really good point. I think what will be really important to ensure that no harm is done to the community, uh, to patients, clients, to therapists, is that we would have to build out a brand new treatment protocol. So for folks who haven't tried MDMA versus psilocybin, it is a very, very different experience, and therefore we need a different treatment protocol and a different training. So what's really alarming to me is people will go to do their training with different organizations, and then they think they're psychedelic psychotherapists. MDMA is very chatty. You're gonna be talking the whole time. It's very heart opening, generally for PTSD. So what I would say is if we did go that route, new treatment protocol, new training protocol, brand new training, it wouldn't be incorporated into our current training unless we made it two weeks long because there's so much to cover. I think that there might be good reasons to stay it's interesting that uh, Oregon has reached out because they're the first state that has uh, approved a training program that consists of 50 hours of training for any high school graduate and older requirements. And that's a whole lot different than what's occurring here. It's it's um, pretty crazy. Like I was listening to a podcast and to be you know a plumber, to be a hairdresser, to to be pretty much any other professional job, you need two I think it's 2,300 hours to become a hairdresser, 2,500 hours of practice to become a plumber, journeyman plumber. Um, those are just two examples. My brothers are plumbers, so I know how many hours they've gone through. But it's just crazy that you can only, you only need 50 hours of experience to join their training program, and it's alarming. So I don't think we need to swing out that far to get things off the ground. But yeah, be a bit more conservative. Does there still have a low dose treatment protocol as well? Like so, transition somebody from SSRIs to microdose or incorporate that into weed one off and onto the other? Everything is patient centered, so it, the treatment team will go through that experience with the patient. Um, of course, in research, it's 25 milligrams or 5 grams, um, but it will depend on what the treatment things for that patient and they could always work. So the patient have to be off their other meds then in order to do that? It will really depend on which meds they are and that's why we always engage our clinical pharmacist, Jake Dahl, when there's more complicated scenarios on what the tapering program would look like. And it's interesting to see some studies come forward recently where they're saying, no, they, they can't stay on their SSRI. So there's still so many unknowns that we'd have to engage Jake to based on each patient. Um, a few unrelated questions. Uh, so research um, from other countries, how does that appear in Canada, uh, either clinical trials or other um, clinical research on themselves? So does that have any bearing here? Or oh, absolutely. I mean, you know what? It, it certainly supports our, uh, I would just say any research, like research is knowledge, right? If anything, it tells the researchers where to look, what to look at. Um, I'm sure it also helps with research ethics too, and you know, setting precedents on what's been done in other countries. Um, you can also build off it. So, you know, to date, of all the research that's been done, actually not much of it has been done in Canada. Yet it's all supported us. So we actually had those researchers, as yeah, that's had mentioned in your slide, writing letters to our minister saying, "Look, it, we've done the research in this country. It's safe. It's effective." And our government accepts that. Okay, so several so trials can. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It, again, just depends on where the research is being done, to what standards, yeah, but they're not as accepted. I was going to say, from my experience, uh, the government, they love Canadian studies. They don't like studies from other places. Mm -hmm. It's got to be Canada. Okay. Right? BC. Hopefully, BC. Hopefully. <laughs> not the United States. <laughs> okay, not we'll get on it. <laughs> okay. My second question is, um, I realize this does not fit in with your mission, but are 
do you think we were any reason to be happy with just exemptions in Canada? I know that paper is not scheduled because of uh, connection to American law and exemptions there. Um, do you know if the subtle side of this and second path that anyone's following? Not that I know. Like, I know ayahuasca through the Santa Diamond churches has been granted Section 56 access. Um, I actually don't know of many like religious groups in Canada that are practicing with psilocybin. If they applied, like I would love to help them. I think it, there would be no reason why they couldn't have access. Um, Part of the white tradition. Yeah, uh, and what I know about many of the indigenous groups using it is they're just using it. At, you know, it's almost like uh, we don't need we don't need to request access. And I think there's a bit of knowledge or wisdom in that. Uh, why ask for something that you know the government's not going to enforce laws in which you have a cultural and uh, you know heritage right to? Um, and I know that UNDRIP, um, the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights, also has under their section, I think it's 14 or 7, uh, the same thing as our constitutional, or as our constitution, that uh, you know Indigenous people across the world have the right to life and liberty, secure persons with their traditional medicines. So, um, you know, in the past, the lawyers that I've spoken with have said to uh, at least me that if any of those groups wanted access, they should just be accessing it. And, they don't really need to ask. And, you know, that's kind of what's happening for a lot of people in Canada. Right now. Two classes of Canadian get together. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Something that's, that's not like lost on me, and I've heard the topic <coughs> about it a lot, and this is like, it's like, I think at its surface, especially for like that, like, you know, kind of that, I'm not a critical public eye. Uh, it could appear as like, oh, it's like, well, a few patients are getting it, but it's not, you know, access isn't as good as it could be, it could be better, but government's moving along, but they're slow, but it's, but it's, it's far more than uh, a negligence resulting in, in poor health care. It's, it's, to, to me, it's like a fundamentally, fundamentally violent aspect of the healthcare system that is denying what is, you know, studies clearly shown to be the safest and the most effective treatment for some of the most severe illnesses. And yeah, just how many, you know, each day that it's not legal, that it's not accessible, that it's been criminalized for so long, is how many people have been harmed in that? You know, that's not even a number that I think is really judicially considered, but it's, it's, it's a massive thing and ever growing. Yeah, you're so right, and it's pushing people underground, right? And um, there are so many underground practitioners who are unbelievable and are, you know, treating these patients who can't get access through Canada's system. But I think one thing to consider and why we're taking this more conservative route is when we don't belong to a college with a code of ethics, there's no discipline, right? There's no disciplinary action. And so, like you said, it's very clear there's a mental health crisis happening in Canada. People should have access to psilocybin. Um, but on top of that, we are really pushing underground people underground, which could be okay for some clients, but it's not for many others. Um, when you're working on a one-on-one -on -one model, that is that's dangerous. It, a criminal. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's so much to consider that we really want to send a message home on. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to VAPS yeah. for hosting us. Nick and John. John is very so Nick and VAPS as well. Yeah. They, I'll just put all of this together with their lovely faces and not yes. here with John and Nick. Thank you, John and Nick. Yeah, thank you, John and Nick. Awesome. Cool. We got the room booked for a little bit, so if anyone has questions or wants to hang around, then uh, yeah, feel free. <laughs> Do you want to hit end stream there? So yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's say thanks, everyone. I want you to tell the Instagram to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you. Awesome.
ya, ya. 